This chapter is going to follow up on our initial one to try and get more into specific strategies we're going to use to develop an accounting information system. You should find that it builds on the prior chapter by being a little bit more concrete and talking about specific strategies that we can use. We're going to kind of break it into three general camps, buy, build, and outsource. So at this point, you should have already done the systems analysis phase. You've discovered what the problem is. You've got the business context. You understand the limitations and restrictions imposed by your environment. And now you want to actually start working on some kind of solution. And usually at this point, you have to answer the question, buy versus build. Do we build something ourselves to exactly fit our needs? Or is there a package or software out there that we can install and adapt to fit our problems? So answering the question, buy versus build, gives us three primary approaches. We can buy a brand new system from outside of our organization. We can develop it in-house. And this could be either by the IT department or even end-user computing. And user computing is a term used to describe accountants or other systems users who are going to create something out of Excel or maybe some online form through a SharePoint app. But it's a way to create some stuff without IT being involved. And of course, we could always outsource as well. Get someone from outside the organization to come in and help us out with some sort of development process. Purchasing. So how do we do this process? Well, generally speaking, what we'll do is an RFP. An RFP is a request for proposal for some kind of specialized or high-end system. Now, you're not going to do this from Microsoft Excel or Word or buying some you know, $100 app from a website. This is for you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars level projects, millions of dollars projects. These projects are big enough that the vendor is going to have a team of people whose job it is to actually look at your requests and be able to tell you if the software can do the things you want it to do. So usually you'll start by choosing a couple of vendors. You'll write an RFP to send to them. And they're going to respond to that proposal RFP with their own proposal. You then evaluate the proposals, maybe even doing some demonstrations, and then make some kind of selection based off of whatever criteria you set out. So let's kind of break the process down a little bit. Here's how you can think about creating a standard RFP. So under phase one here, we have the, the elements we've already done in the synthesis analysis phase. And we've talked about scope, we've talked about problems, budget, timeline, all that kind of thing. There are a couple other elements on here that relate just to, to RFPs. One of the key ones here is this scoring criteria and review process. So that says before we actually send out our different uh, elements, we want to make sure we know how are we going to actually judge which project or which company we're going to go with. Then we're going to put together the RFP. The RFP has a lot of different sections on it that you can just kind of work through and process. So we start out with the basic introduction, you know, what are we looking for, who are we, your statement of purpose, what are the goals for the system. Background information might include a little bit about the company, what industry you're in, how large you are. Scope of work. This is important because you might ask for different levels of activity from your vendor. Some vendors, you might just want the software, and then you'll do all the installation yourself. Other times, you might want to have the vendor quote you not only the software, but also installation, configuration, customization, and end user training. You might even include in this ongoing vendor support. Budget, it's good to have some idea for the vendor of what you're prepared to spend on the project. That way, if their software is just too expensive or large for you, you can minimize people's waste of time, and they won't apply for it. What are the contract terms? What are schedules? What's the timeline to review the RFPs? And then if you want them to have any specific requirements in the proposals, you'd lay that out there. For example, you might want to have all vendors list three prior companies who've used their particular software package, and then a list of references that you can call and talk to. After the RFP is drafted, you're going to issue it out there. Companies will give you proposals back, and then you're going to go ahead and review them. Typically, this involves scoring them on some set of criteria. You select finalists, do interviews, reference checks, and then do final contract negotiations. So here's kind of a nice little template that you might fill out for an RFP. And you can see kind of how the different sections all fit together. You end up with a fairly detailed memo, because if you don't give the vendor enough information, they're not going to know enough to accurately quote the project for you. Here's an example of point scoring. So 
you would set this up before you actually send out the RFPs. And the idea is that it's a fair and unbiased way of evaluating the quality of each proposal. This particular example has three different vendors. They've established about 10 to 15 different criteria. And then you score each of the vendor's proposals. Now, it, this does look somewhat scientific, but it is also a little bit on the vague side too. I mean, do you give someone a score of six, of 10, of two, of one? Uh, so there's always human judgment involved. This is a way to sort of think about all these different elements and be a little bit more objective in how you choose between different vendors. So then at the end of this process, you should be thinking, all right, when do we want to buy a software versus build a software? All right, so let's say yes. All right, what are the situations that would cause you to purchase software? One is for tasks specified by external parties. In other words, bookkeeping. Bookkeeping is a standardized, well-defined, um, very externally standardized process. You don't go into a company and decide you want to do debits and blebits, right? You're going to do debits and credits. It's going to be pretty well locked down. So whenever you have something like that, the odds are there's software out there that'll do what you want it to do. Tasks used by many companies, for example, payroll or AP or AR, those are things also you're probably going to want to purchase. You get this benefit by buying software externally because the development cost of that software is split up among all the users of that software. Think, for example, about Microsoft Excel. If your company decided to make its own copy of Microsoft Excel, you'd spend millions of dollars on it. But because Microsoft can split up the cost of Excel among its millions of users, everyone pays about 100 bucks or so. You also want to purchase software when there's a significant, complex, or interrelated programming setup for it. For example, an ERP. An ERP has a lot of different components that all need to work together. And so often, even though it's really expensive, you're better off buying a pre-made package just because it integrates easily between the different modules. For example, your payroll module integrates with inventory, inventory integrates with your tax, you know, all those sorts of things like that. And whenever you have those really complex interrelationships, you're much better off with the standardized software. But the key thing to think about here is anything that allows you to pool development resources between many clients is a good thing. Now, people often don't want to make, don't want to purchase software. Instead, they want to make software to fit their own particular unique setup. Now, this can be both good and bad. If that unique setup is part of your company's secret sauce, then yeah, you would want to develop it yourself. You wouldn't want to purchase it. So for example, the delivery algorithm for Uber Eats. That's sort of the core purpose of the company. And so there's some value in keeping that internally to the company and not letting anyone else have access to it. You wouldn't want to build your company's secret sauce off of someone else's tool. Now, again, secret sauce is fairly limited though, right? For Uber Eats, you wouldn't really care as much about payroll or AR or inventory management. So those might be things you'd want to just purchase from another party rather than make something yourself. There are times when your environment is just really, really unique. So for example, I had a prior job where I worked uh, for a company that did expert witness cases. So they would hire people, send them out to go investigate why someone slipped and fell on a stairway, and then issue a report off of it. That was a pretty unique situation. And so I ended up making kind of a just Microsoft Access from scratch system for them to try and help them automate the processes. Today, if we were doing it again, we'd definitely buy something. But at the time, there really wasn't anything that did that kind of work. There's also a lot of time when you'll need some sort of software glue layer. So this could be when you have two different systems that don't talk to each other. There's a whole class of software out there called RPA, or Robotic Process Automation, that builds these interfaces between systems. So it might be that you get an email from your web portal. You want to take that web portal and import it into your ERP system. Well, an RPA might be set up so that it can automatically download this email, parse all the data out, and then automatically input it into a form. And so that kind of thing is a good use of IT sort of end user development. And it's mission critical, but it's so specialized, you probably need to build it in house. We also have customization. So a lot of tools, ERPs nowadays, come with a ton of different options. And the idea is that they give you kind of the core software and then you're gonna tweak and modify it to fit your particular situation. 
And so for Salesforce, you might you know, tweak it with different templates, different workflow options, different controls on top of it to make it really fit your business. And the key thing here is you want to purchase a software when you get that allows the pooling of resources. And you want to build it yourself when you lead to some sort of significant efficiency or the quality of your end product. So let's think about this develop in-house, all right? So you've decided that you can't buy the software. Instead, you're going to build what you need yourself. And the hope is that it provides a significant competitive advantage. And that's, again, the key things you have to think about. If it's not making your business better, you shouldn't be doing it. Because developing software in-house has a lot of risks. Software development is very, very time consuming. And this is one of those projects that people don't always understand because this building software is so interrelated. It's a, think about it like building a house. When you build a house, you have steps. You start with the foundation, then you put the walls up, then you put electrical in, plumbing in, drywall, finishings, painting, carpet, right? And you have all these steps that kind of depend upon the prior step. In a lot of ways, building software is kind of like that. You can't build out things until the prior piece is done. So for designing our system, first up might be designing the database. And it's really hard to work on the forms until after the database is completed. It's also hard to see software. With a house, you can walk around and just see, oh, that's done, that's not done. But with software, a lot of it's really invisible unless you're a specialist. And so it can be very, very challenging to kind of keep track of these projects. These are also very complex systems. They involve a lot of interdependencies. It's very technical and tricky to get everything to work right. One of the biggest issues, though, is poor requirements. Often, you don't really understand how complex systems are until you start diving into the minutia of them. And what you'll find, especially with a manual process, is that as you try and automate pieces of it, you find out there's so many special conditions and special requirements and exceptions for the process that developed over time. And you can do that with a paper or manual process, but in IT system, each of those has to be individually programmed, and they can add a lot of time and complexity to a process. We often find issues with communication and cooperation. For example, if I try to automate someone's job, they may not be super happy about that. And so I shouldn't expect for them to give me really good information or really happy to improve the process if the end of the software is going to be them getting fired. It can be very challenging to find qualified people. Programmers with the right specialties are very expensive and difficult to locate. And then often you find people who are really good at it don't get they don't have to go out and find new jobs very often. People often have very good professional networks, and so you'll find often referrals are the best way to find really qualified people. If you're going to develop it in-house, you need to make sure that your upper management is also supportive of the process. It's a significant ongoing investment, both for the initial development as well as for maintenance going forward. Unless they've really bought into the vision and are willing to give resources to it, the project's not going to go well. Now, you might think, well, how do I know if something's complicated? Well, there are different methods out there you can use to kind of estimate the, the cost drivers of a software. For example, let's think about how much reliability is needed. So imagine you're trying to automate a particular inventory management system. Right now, you have pieces of paper or maybe an Excel spreadsheet, and you want to make it a little bit more rigorous. Well, you might need to ask yourself, right, what's the requirement for reliability? If I need it up 100% of the time, that drastically increases the costs. If I can go down you know, once or twice a day, well, to do updates or maintenance, and it's a, an inconvenience, but it's not terrible, then that drastic, drastically cuts my cost. The size of something matters a bit, but these days it's not as huge of an issue just because machines are so capable. You might also need to think about the hardware. Does it need to happen in certain time spans? For example, if I'm building software to fly a jet, I need to have it calculate the trajectory very, very quickly, very, very consistently. If I'm doing an overnight batch process to update inventory, then it's not as much of a big deal. And you think about my people. Do I have people that have had experience doing this before, or is this our first time ever designing anything like this? And think about the project. Do you have proper tools? Do you use Git software, project planning software? 
Do you have the most up-to-date environments uh, to be able to build? Do you have a good server room that can host it? There's a lot of diff different pieces that will also influence complexity of a project. So then you have to ask yourself, well, how much does it cost for this kind of thing? So there's a lot of misinformation going around here. And so it's important to kind of be careful about what you're looking at. But let's kind of break it into a couple of different categories. So there's one website here that's given some ideas of cost of development. And we can start with a simple like bug fix. All right? So we have a software that we use. Maybe it's you know, WordPress, and we're doing hosting a blog with it. And there's a problem. One of the footers isn't displaying on all the pages. Or maybe the copyright date is, is from the last year. And so this could be a simple thing. It could be just simple as you know, a couple of weeks and ten to ten, uh, two to ten thousand dollars. If we're trying to do a new application, though, we might call it like a proof of concept. A proof of concept will be creating a, a prototype which we'll throw away, but it's just there to try and make sure we understand the problem and get a basic idea of how it'll all work together. So this might be something that, you know one month, two month. You're looking at twenty to forty thousand um, dollars. But again, like it's trying to be like a very brief idea for a simple inventory project. You might think about a mobile app. All right, so these are standalone applications that you can program for an iPhone or Android. You're looking at you know, four months, a year for a basic kind of app that basically replicates what your website does. And you might look at it you know, under $100,000. But again, um, as we go through this, you'll notice that these are like really concrete estimates. But the reality is that we don't really know. Right? There's so many different variables that influence costs that this website, as it says, hey, yeah, four months for a mobile app. Well, it didn't take four months to design the latest game uh, from Diablo. It didn't take four months to make Microsoft Excel for the iPhone. So it, there's huge variation here in levels of complexity. And so this is another estimation. But again, I think about what this is saying. Right? It says you could do a basic app for the four, three to four th tens of thousands of dollars. It has some e-commerce apps, some Uber, Spotify, a booking app. Well. Again, like this is this is really optimistic. You think about Uber; they've spent literally billions of dollars developing their different platforms, and this website saying you can do it for sixty-seven thousand dollars, five hundred. Right? That just seems so. It's so specific and so low compared to what Uber does that it's just ridiculous. And so, be really cautious of places like this that will tell you how much a software costs, because they often are very optimistic because they're trying to sell you something. Or saying like a Spotify web app costs only thirty to forty thousand dollars is ridiculous. These actual complexity of these systems is so much beyond what this is that it's just orders of magnitude wrong. So think about some examples, right? Uber, Uber spends billions of dollars in R and D. Um, Spotify or Pandora spend ten percent of revenue on their IT system. Facebook and Alphabet spends nineteen percent or fifteen percent of sales. So think about this, right? So we're looking at these big companies that compete off of technology. If you want to play in the same realm or do similar things, you need to spend money like these people spend money. And so you're looking at, for a technology product, you know, 10, 20% of revenue being spent to develop and maintain the technology for the system. So these are major, major investments. So when you see these kind of charts, um, be very, very cautious because they are not accurate or correct. The other thing you need to think about is that custom software isn't a one and done process. There's a lot of ongoing maintenance and development with it. And actually, the operations phase and maintenance phase tend to be where the bulk of costs occur. You know, projects are expensive. You might spend a couple million dollars on a new system, but then you'll use that system for 20, 30 years, maybe even longer if you're unlucky. And so, there, the yearly maintenance ends up being a substantial portion of the cost, and the majority of the cost for most systems. All right, let's look at the last one, outsourcing. So say you've talked about buying a system and it's not workable. You've talked about making it yourself. You don't have the competency. So you're like, you know what? Let's just do something easy. Let's outsource it. How do, we, how do we react to that? Well, there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages here. The advantage is, is that it lets you concentrate on your core competency. What is it that your company does really, really well? What is it that you're better at than anyone else? So if you are a company that manages inventory, all right, that's great. Then you should focus on managing inventory. and You don't want to create your own accounting system because that's not what you're good at. That's not what you want to be good at. 
you look back at the companies that developed over time, you look at something like Ford. Ford started out as a fully vertically integrated company. They did everything. They made their own tires, they made their own engines, they made company towns for workers. I mean, they did everything themselves. But over time, they realized that they can't be masters of everything. So they started buying things from other people. So for example, Bridgestone Tires, you know, they just realized that they're not good at making tires. And so it's better for them to buy tires from somebody else instead of making it themselves. And today, if you look at Ford, you find they outsource a lot of their stuff. They are really good at certain things and they want to be best in the world at designing vehicles, but they may not be the best in the world at maintaining vehicles or the best in the world at building specific components. And so for them, they need to get rid of anything they're not going to be best in the world at. So outsourcing can allow you to do that. We also think about asset utilization. There are some kinds of equipment that are so specialized, we only need them fairly rarely. You know, think about you know, buying a pickup truck. How often do you use that pickup truck to actually move somebody? Well, not very often. So it's really more efficient for you to buy a cheaper sedan and then just to rent a truck when you need it. And that's basically the idea behind outsourcing. Maybe you have a seasonal pattern where you have customers coming in and buying things in summer but not in winter. Well, if that's the case, you don't need to have a lot of extra servers hanging around doing nothing during the winter when no one's making purchases. So it's better for you to rent them from Amazon for the busy season and then turn them off for winter. You can get access to expertise. So if you're doing a company, you don't want to run your own email system. Instead, you pay Microsoft or pay Google to do that for you. And you do that because they are really, really good at it. They have the best engineers in the world. They got tons of expertise. And so the system that they can give you is going to be a lot better than you can do in-house. You can standardize costs. We can split development costs between projects. So this is back to Word. There's no reason to pay to make your own copy of Word when Microsoft's already done all the work for you. You can also cut development time. Whenever you estimate how long a project's going to last, you should really double that, maybe triple it. And so by outsourcing, you can actually spool up quicker than if you make it yourself. Uh, usage, we can balance out our usage a little bit more. And the last piece is what everyone focuses on, facilitates downsizing. So this is, again, a pro and a con, right? If you think about it from an ethical perspective, you may not want to outsource just to fire all your staff. And if you think about it, the outsourcing company is going to have to do the same thing that your current staff do. So I worked for a university back in California that laid off a bunch of people in its IT department. And the idea was that they're going to cut costs by outsourcing. But all that work still remained, and so the outsourcing company still had to have the same people that the university had, but now the outsourcing company is going to charge a cut on all of them as well. And part of this goes into disadvantages. So inflexibility. When the university outsourced IT, every time scope changed or conditions changed, it turned into a contract negotiation. Instead of saying, sure, we can handle that, we got the people, it turned into how much money will you pay us for something? Because you don't have control. The outsourcing provider's incentives are not the same as yours. They want to provide the acceptable level of quality at the minimum cost, and that's how they make money. If they overstaff or have too uh, highly paid of employees, they're going to lose money in the contract. And so they are going to be very careful about scope creep. They're going to be reduced competitive advantage. If we outsource our IT, then we can't depend on the IT giving us an advantage over any other organization out there. We're also locked in. Once you sign those contracts, you offload all of your workers, you've lost all the institutional knowledge about how the business works and how IT works. So if you ever wanted to switch back to in-house in it, you're going to basically be starting from zero. And because their incentives are different, what you'll find is that they typically have worse service and higher risk. And that's because their incentives are opposite of yours. Now, outsourcing is not the same as offshoring. Outsourcing means we send work to another company. Offshoring says we send work to another country. And they could be the same. Right? You could outsource to an Indian firm or an Australian firm or a German firm. Um, but they're, they're technically separate pieces. Off Shoring has additional risks over outsourcing because you have the cultural components and you have the time disadvantage as well. 
But basically, the outsourcing as a role is not necessarily bad. It can be very good to help you specialize and focus as a company, but you have to understand it comes with significant risks. So why do people offshore or outsource? Well, we can see this with some estimates of salaries across different areas. And again, this is sort of older data, but it's probably still roughly accurate in terms of perspectives. So we look at a single person doing a business analyst role in the US, compare them to Eastern Europe, Latin America, or Asia, and you can see it's a dramatic reduction in cost. We're going down to developers, you're looking at you know, a quarter of the cost to have someone in Asia do the work as someone in the US. Now, again, that has significant caveats. Uh, if you outsource to the lowest cost provider, you're going to get the lowest quality service. So when you look at these outsourced companies, you may not want to go with the cheapest Indian firm because they're having the least experienced people. You may want to look for the higher end firms that cost more but have better quality service. And you also also realize that there's always a honeymoon phase with these projects where the outsourcing company, whether in the US or in Europe or Asia, they're going to have their best people on the contract for the first six months. Over time, though, they're going to roll those really high-quality, high-skill people off of the, new pro off of the projects uh, and go to new business instead. And so you're going to see a decline in quality after a year or six months as that rotation process happens. And you just have to kind of expect that's going to occur. So let's talk about other in-house systems. So we talk about systems that you can do in-house. We have this category of end-user computing. And end-user computing is things like Excel or SharePoint, systems that the end-user can set up or tweak or modify. One whole class of these are called business process management systems. So these are basically workflows. They're ways of automating a process. Instead of having a person stand up, get a piece of paper, write a note on it, hand it to someone else, they approve it, it goes to a third person, then it gets actually done. Then we can use these business process management systems to kind of build out those workflows for us. These typically have an engine, they have analytics, they have reporting tools, collaboration, even content management systems. And so you kind of will look at like a flow chart. So when I think about a flow chart, it's got inputs and outputs, it's got activities, it's got storage, data flows, and decision steps. And we basically take these flow charts and these symbols and we put them into a business process management tool. Now, the same guidelines will apply to flowcharts as business process management tools. We want to think about business flows. We want to start from the upper left corner and go to bottom right. We want to clearly label everything. And we end up with something that kind of looks like this. So this is one example of a workflow management system that is laid out like a flowchart. And you can see we can kind of drag things around and connect lines to them. And the same ideas from flowcharts kind of apply to these as well. So for example, we start with the process in the upper left. We have a form people fill out. It goes for initial review. If it fails, it goes back, and then they have to rework it. If it passes, then it goes forward. Uh, you can kind of get the idea here. But basically, these systems are an easy way to do basic workflow without a lot of really tedious programming. Prototyping. Prototyping is an approach to designing a system where you plan on throwing away your work. You think, whoa, that seems, that seems weird. Why would you plan on throwing away your work? Well, imagine building a new airplane. You're going to spend billions of dollars on this airplane. Maybe before you build one out of carbon fiber with everything specialized, everything perfectly done, you wanted to do a, just a quick mock-up and see if it just flies. Right? And you're, you know it's not going to be perfect, but you're doing kind of a 90% quality or 90% fidelity where you can just sort of see and throw it into a wind tunnel and see what happens. You see this also with car design. A lot of times car designers will create a clay model of the entire car because you, you get something from the physical model of a thing you can't get from the digital design of that same thing. And just seeing it in the real world and interacting with it will let you know things that you couldn't understand otherwise. So prototype in the same way, but you might prototype in code. So how might this look? Well, you might build a prototype on something as simple as PowerPoint. You could mock up a couple of screens. You can drag some fields onto it. And then have people click on it to kind of see what the workflow would be as data goes throughout the system. It could be in something like Microsoft Access. It could be something in Microsoft Excel. But the idea is you, you build something just to kind of test it and see if you really understand the problem. 
Once you do, then you go back and you actually do the formal system design, but now you have this prototype to kind of help guide you. So ironically, this can actually speed up your development time. And it speeds up to the time because it gets uncertainties fleshed out earlier in the process. What you want is you want to spend you know, probably 30 to 50% of your time in the systems analysis and blueprint phase of designing a system. Because you want to figure out all the different elements, all the different issues before you start actually creating this in code. The longer you wait to, to uh, do the code, the earlier you find the errors, the least cost you're going to have. Now, the disadvantage is, is that it requires a lot of user interaction and engagement. So if you really understand the system already, it may not be super efficient. We also have this thing called agile development. Agile is trying to come between waterfall and uh, prototyping with kind of a, a midpoint here. And the idea is we go through the SDLC multiple times, doing kind of one module at a, mo at a time. And the idea is we want to get our data or our system out there with users as quickly as possible to flesh out things that we don't understand or don't know. All right, so here's some kind of key terms you might look for in the software sections of our textbook. Um, but hopefully that gives you a basic idea of the key decisions for buy versus build. All right, so this is again the second phase of the SDLC. Uh, we're looking at trying to design a system that we want and we're trying to decide here, do we buy it? Do we create it ourselves or do we outsource it? And hopefully at this point, you've got a fairly good feeling for some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these three major approaches to creating a software system.